You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. How many of you have ever been afraid of something? Okay. Let me tell you, when I was growing up, the one thing I was afraid of was darkness. And it was very, very specific. I lived in a house at 140 Bangoche Street in Lagos that was a compound. In this compound, there were many families. It was a big house. I have the picture online, if you see the picture of the house where I was born. And it was at least, I would say, probably no less than 50, 60 yards long. There were at least five families, units, before you got to where the kitchen, the common kitchen was, the common bathroom, the common latrine. And then our house, and in between our house, there was another family we called Babai Jebu. So, When I come in at night and I enter the front of the house, it will take me a long journey to get to my house. Somewhere in my head, as a little boy, I always thought, during the day there was no boogeyman. But at night, When it was dark, they were hiding all over the place. And I would walk, preparing until I got to the fifth house, the fifth unit, I should say. And after that unit, there's open space where the boogie people were hiding. Many of you didn't know, I, I was the third leg on the relay race <laughs> in my high school because I had practice <laughs> when I was growing up. Every single night, whether there was practice or not, mine was there. I would read, stay by the fifth unit. And all of a sudden, go! (laughs) You are afraid of something. And many people in America, and I found this to be a uniquely American experience. Know that it's not all over the world. But in America, people are afraid to be alone. I have had experiences with many people who got into trouble. Amen. She's hearing my voice. (laughs) Who got into trouble in marriage because they just didn't want to be alone. They'll marry anybody. Just not to be alone. I need somebody in the house. What if he's a thief? What if he's an abuser? I just need a body. I don't want to sleep in my bed alone. And because we are afraid, we make so many mistakes, we ruin our own lives 
because of fear. Many Christians are afraid to be alone. Let's look at John chapter 16. I'm not going to be long. In John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus had a discussion with his uh, disciples. That was in preparation for him leaving them. And in, in chapter 16, he started by saying, all this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Now, verse 5. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. How can that be? You see, the disciples have been told Jesus is going. Oh, what are we going to do? In fact, we know that they were afraid because immediately after the resurrection, after the, the death and crucifixion of Jesus, what did they do? They went into hiding. They went into hiding. The man has gone. Now I'm going to tell him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I brought this to you this morning to tell you that in regard to evangelism, you don't have to be afraid because you are not alone. You're not alone. This is how we conquer the fear of going out and inviting people, of going out and witnessing to people, of going out and telling people of the grace of God, of going out and sharing with people what God has blessed you with. Jesus is with you. Amen. Hallelujah. I've been in two close situations. One where the man said he was going to shoot me. And I said, good evening, good day. God bless you. I'm on my way. When you're going out, you're not alone. Jesus said, I am going to go to my father, but you're not alone because I will send you the counselor. 
Amen. Amen. I will send you the spirit of truth. We're going to talk about it a little bit. You are not an orphan. Amen. I wish everybody would say amen like her. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I watch uh, a lot of Nollywood movies. Nollywood, that's Nigerian Hollywood. Nigerian Hollywood is called Nollywood. And in Nollywood movies, always... When the prince or the princess are going outside of the palace, they always have guards with them. Amen? And the guards will hold on to a machete, a, a sword that is sharper than two edge. <laughs> and they will go, they always carry. I said, what? I wonder one day if you're just carrying this sword and somebody comes with a gun, what are you going to do? But of course, in those days, they didn't have, no, not too many people have guns. But the point is, when you leave the palace, and you're going out in the community, as a prince or a princess, you have a guard always with you. When you are a child of the kingdom, Wherever you go, God is always with you because the Holy Spirit is always with you. You are never alone. It meant even when you go into the enemy's camp, the Holy Spirit is with you. You are never alone as a Christian. You are not alone in living the Christian life. You are not alone in working for God. You are not alone in your temptations. You are not alone in witnessing or in evangelism. The reason why many of us don't understand it is because we don't know who the Holy Spirit is. Many of us say we're Baptists, but we live like Jehovah Witnesses. We think the Holy Spirit is just some mighty force. Some wind blowing. Amen. I've seen many Baptists who want to tell the Holy Spirit what to do. Because he can't think. In fact, many of us call him it. Amen. Many songs, many albums have come out from the Christian field that said, it, it, it moved me. Talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit has mind. The Holy Spirit has intellect. The Holy Spirit has emotions. The Holy Spirit has will. But not only that, the Holy Spirit is a person that has a relationship with you. Now, I don't blame you. If you don't have a relationship with him, you can't trust him. I wish I had some people that can testify to that. You see, because there is a difference when you become a Christian. I may be stepping on my own self right now. You know, if I have a point that I'm talking about now, I'll go back to it and talk about it again. Okay. Now, if you are a Christian, you were born again by the Holy Spirit, and the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit resides in you. He lives in you. He abides with you. That's a relationship. Yeah. 
the Holy Spirit gives to us, all Christians, no exception. If you become a Christian today after I finish speaking, you have the same privilege as the person who has been a Christian for 50 years. Let me just name some of them. Some of the privileges and the relationship that we have. Some of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us as Christians. Number one, he teaches us the word. If you're ignorant of the word, it's because you're not having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You're not spending time with the Holy Spirit. That's why you're ignorant. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Carpenter. Some of us Christians, if I don't want you to find the money that I want to hide, I'll put it in your Bible. Because you'll never find it. Unless you get so lucky the pastor is preaching on the passage and you brought your Bible with you. Now you use your cell phone. Okay. Too many Christians don't recognize. Is that from the Bible? Yes. It's from the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you've been reading it and you've been asking the Holy Spirit to help you, the Holy Spirit is the one who opens up your mind, opens up your eyes so you can see what the Lord is telling you. Amen. Another important thing that most of us don't do as we ought to do, and the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to do it, is pray. If you have relationship with the Holy Spirit, you stay. You need to start doubting your Christianity if you're not praying. I just don't have time. There are too many things. My life is so busy and so clouded. You be like the man who fell in the ditch with all this load and asking somebody to pull them out of the ditch. And the guy got there and started helping him and he couldn't pull. He said, hey, you're heavy. <laughs> he said, what's going on? And he looked in there and said, you mean you want to carry all that load? If you want to get out of there, you leave your stuff behind. Too many of us have stuff. That's why we can't even relate to the Holy Spirit because we still want our stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I'm married to a woman that likes to clean their... Maybe I shouldn't say I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy that she's clean. I'm not happy that she wants to get rid of everything. Especially mine. <laughs> you cannot serve God and you cannot worship God. You cannot have relationship with God with all that stuff. The Holy Spirit will teach us to pray. Not only that, the Holy Spirit gives us all the spiritual gifts that we need. Amen. Amen. Don't start asking me, do we have the spirit of healing? Do we have the gift of uh, forgiveness? Do we have the gift of Do we have the gifts? Amen. 
Some of us just don't want to use the gifts. Some of us don't even want to know if we have gifts. Amen, lights. You've been in the church for 20 years. You haven't used one gift. Filled with the Holy Spirit. How can you be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has given you at least one gift and for 20 years you haven't used one? I forgot I was just trying to tell you you're not alone. (laughs) The Holy Spirit gives us power. Power. Authority. Power to heal. Power to forgive. Power to lift up. Power to encourage. The Holy Spirit has given us power. <laughs> if we start using the power that the Holy Spirit has given to us, we are not going to be wondering why people are not coming here because they'll be jumping to come in. Holy Spirit helps us to focus on Jesus. Amen. It's all in the passage. He's not going to come to do his own thing. He's going to come to do what Jesus asked him to do. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Oh, I'm sure glad about that. I need sanctification every day. Amen. And many of us don't know this. You are indwelled by the Holy Spirit on a permanent basis. Amen. But you have to ask God for a fresh anointing every day. Amen. When you get up, fill me, Holy Spirit. I, I know you indwell me. I know you're there. But fill me, Holy Spirit. Give me a fresh anointing today. As I go out on the streets and the corners, give me a fresh anointing. When I speak, let them hear God. When I pray, let something happen. Give me a fresh anointing. No matter how you feel, know that the Holy Spirit has given us and continues to give us all that we need to have a great relationship with God. Amen? Let me, let me conclude this message. I say the time is gone. I want you to know you're not alone. I want you to know you're not alone. Not only that, let me let me say that there are some passages that I listed out there. The uh, media team may have put them up there. I'm, I'm just ignoring it. But but I want you to know that beside the passages that I read today, Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four, that's also Matthew twenty eight twenty, and you all know it. Amen. Who can say it? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Amen. Come on. You did good. You did good. Come up here. I know you're different. For I am with you. Until when? Until the end of the age. So you're never alone. God is with you. If you're doing what he asks you to do, he is with you. Let me tell you something else that you ought to be happy about. I'm getting ready to give you the best news ever. Some of you may not believe me, but I'll share some passages with you so you know your argument is very lame. I don't care what argument you have. Now, let me tell you this. The Holy Spirit is the only one 
responsible for salvation. Did you get me? I don't care how smart you are. You can't even save a fly. If it depends upon you, nobody will be saved. The Holy Spirit is the only one responsible for salvation. In 1970-something, I bought this book. I was at Golden Gate Seminary doing my master's in theology program, and William Hendricks recommended, this is one of the seven books we had to read for the class, The Church in the Power of the Holy Spirit, written by a German named Jürgen Moltmann. And I will never forget the message of Jürgen Moltmann. I recommend it to you was published by Harper and Rowe. I don't know if it's been published by some, somebody else. If you're interested, after the message, you can come over here and look at it. The church is powerless without the Holy Spirit. You can make a shout. You can dance. You can have noise. You can have drums. You can have everything you want. You can have ushers every door. You can have ushers in the lobby. You can have ushers out there. If the Holy Spirit is not in the church, you are dead. Sometimes the reason why many of us have to be cheerleaded into worship is because the Holy Spirit is not here. If the Holy Spirit is working in you, nobody has to beg you to worship God. Amen. Amen. There are times I'm so tired, but when I get to the church, all I have to hear is just the bar of the song. And I'm energized. Amen. My hands are heavy, but I can raise them. Praise God. If the Holy Spirit is not here, the church is dead. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how easy you think the person is, I recommend to you, nobody can say Jesus is Lord. Except by what? Some of you don't believe that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, amen, many of us were pagans before we got saved. Okay? Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to dumb idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Aren't you happy you can say, Jesus is Lord? I'm going to say it several times. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I believe it. Jesus is Lord. I don't want anything with the devil. I don't want anything with the demon. I want God in my life. Jesus is Lord. You don't just say it, but you believe it. Amen. If Jesus asks you, jump. If he is Lord, you don't become a philosopher. What do you mean by jump? <laughs> if Jesus is Lord, there is no philosophy. Amen. You just Nike it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt do what? That Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. You will be saved. 
For it is what? And it with your heart. And I what? Justify. What does that mean? You can't even be saved unless you say Jesus is Lord. Not just mouth it, but it comes from your heart. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is priest. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is master. Jesus is everything. Jesus is all that world to me. Did you get it? Let's look at John chapter 6, verse 44. I'm getting ready to close. John chapter 6, verse 44. I just, I just want you to know this. So when you go out, don't worry about, oh, I said this and they didn't accept Christ. If they didn't accept Christ, it's because the Holy Spirit didn't make them. You just do your job. Stop worrying about who accepts. John 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen? You can take all this food into Chris's house. If Chris is not going to accept Christ, your food will be good meals. That's all it is. Unless the Holy Spirit draws that person. Let us stop coming up with gimmicks. If it's in the Bible, it's not gimmicks. Are you following me? But you coming up with something. Well, let's do this. Let's start dancing. So people can come. <laughs> Let's start giving a hundred dollars out every Sunday. So people will come. Gimmicks. Amen. The Holy Spirit is not interested in your money. You cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. Do your job. Amen. Present the gospel and let God do it. Let's go to another passage real quick. I'm getting ready to shut up. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. Romans chapter 8 verse 7. You know I don't have time to do all the exegesis and everything. But I just want you to get the point. Romans chapter 8 verse 7. Because the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Nor can it do it. Did you see it this morning? The way of the master. Yeah. Right? Yes. A guy will give his life for 10 million. But won't give his eyes. What are your eyes without your life? Doesn't even make any sense. But do you know why I know he means what he means? Because the mind of the sinful mind is hostile to God. Listen. Because the sinful mind is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Unless the spirit quickens them, they can do it. Amen. I ran away from Titi Lola Ezekiel for so many times until the Holy Spirit, I thought he caught me, but the Holy Spirit caught me. And you can see also in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 22, you cannot do it. It will not be done but without the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be obedient to Christ without the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot confess Christ. 
you know, on the island of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say I am? And then Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. You couldn't even have known that if the God did not reveal it to you. You cannot become a Christian until God opens your heart and turns you around. I don't care if you are an Armenian. You cannot turn to God unless God turns you around. Because why? Because we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. Wouldn't you say somebody is crazy if they came to a funeral and started talking to the cops and, and saying, get up. Get up, let's dance. I'm here to show you something. What are you going to say? Say, let's call in the psychiatrist. How can a dead person respond to God? You cannot respond to God unless God makes it possible. And guess what? That is the assurance that I have. That when I go out, when somebody gives their life to Christ, it wasn't because of what I said. It was because the Holy Spirit Amen. turned their hearts to him. You're not alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. When you go out, you're already equipped. You're ready. Let God do what he can do. And you do what you should do. And let the Holy Spirit manifest his blessing. World without the Holy Spirit is world without Christians, without missionaries, without evangelists, without healers, without miracle workers, without Christian counselors. Because no one can become a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is at work to make it possible. Let us pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.